like to call the Education Committee meeting of October 30th, 2017 to order. Roll call, Mr. Barbarulo. Here. Mrs. Frankel. Present. Mr. Klein. Yep. Mrs. Piella. Here. Ms. Quackenbush. Here. Mr. Rosenberg here. Mr. Spindell. Present. Mrs. Wallace. Here. Mr. Banta. Please here. join me in the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Meeting Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of the public bodies of which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the Fairland Board of Education has caused no notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof distributed to the persons on the approved list posted in the Board of Ed Education Administrative Office and sent to the Bergen Record and the Star Ledger. The announcement posting for the Education Committee meeting along with the date, place, and time thereof was distributed on September uh, 20th, 2017. The items to be discussed during, there will not be a closed session, so. Um, so tonight we have three things on the agenda, but I think there's a slight change in the order. So um, the first thing that we're going to talk about or learn about is Digital Literacy and Learning Ally by Gary and Nick. Sure. Um, so first I'd like to welcome everybody to the Education Committee meeting and thank you for coming out tonight. I'd like to thank the supervisors for uh, supporting us and we've got two teachers in the audience as well that are going to help present Karen Rood and Brian McCord. So thank you for taking the time out to come and present to the board um, and I'd like to welcome the public um, as well. So our first presentation is on digital literacy and learning ally. Digital literacy is actually one of our district goals um, that we are going to be working on primarily in the English department right now, but uh, this is our first year embarking upon it. We're very excited. And so Gary Kenkowitz, our ELA supervisor, as well as Nick Norcia, our assistant superintendent of student services, will be presenting on digital literacy and then a connection uh, with a program that we are rolling out called Learning Ally. So I'm going to turn it over to Gary Kenkowitz. Um, before I begin with the actual digital literacy presentation, I just want to make a quick announcement because I think it's uh, very important. We have a multimodal and interdisciplinary uh, Fairlawn High School assembly uh, that's going to be performed on November 16th during periods three and four. That's for all students, uh, but we'll be doing a, uh, a exploration of the context of the Great Gatsby. So the English teacher will be talking about the um, historical social context. The social studies teacher will be talking about the economics during that time period. Um, the music teacher actually has students performing in the jazz uh, ensemble to go through jazz music during that time. And the art teacher will be um, going through some of the artworks during that time. So it should be a really nice uh, assembly. And then we're following up with some kind of activity, which we're still brainstorming, so that we do a little bit of reflection on that particular piece. So now I'd like to start with the uh, goal for digital literacy and multimodal argumentation. This is a district goal. So one of my trademarks, whenever I present to a large group of people, I like to start with a poem. I think it helps me uh, <laughs> shake my nerves off a little bit, and it's something I'm very comfortable with. Um, so I wanted to start with a uh, poem. In this case, it's a song. So I'm going to read the first part of this song to you. You may have heard on the radio. Um, it's by the Chainsmokers and Coldplay. The title is something just like this. I've been reading books of old, the legends and the myths, Achilles and his gold, Hercules and his gifts, Spider-Man's control, and Batman with his fists, and clearly I don't see myself upon that list. But she said, where do you want to go? How much you want to risk? I'm not looking for somebody with some superhuman gifts, some superhero, some fairy tale bliss, just something I can turn to somebody I can kiss. I want something just like this. So I'm going to ask you to first reflect upon the meaning that you get from that alphabetic text. Just those words on the page. And then I'd like to do something different. I'm going to play the music video. 
Uh, at which point, because it's a music video, you'll have exposure to sound and the images. Um, and luckily, I chose a video that also has the alphabetic text pop up at the same time. And I just want you to think about having the multimodal presentation of the song, how that contributes to making an enhanced meaning. I can go through the ad on this YouTube channel. Really. What's the poetic rhythm poem? What is like that? I'll just play maybe like the first 30 seconds or so. Certain meter. Can't remember. you get from that just the enhanced meaning that you get from the multimodal presentation. So we did that activity with teachers uh, in the middle school and in the high school and what we found was there was just so much more um, to the ideas represented from the author. Um, this is something we want our students to be able to do. We want them to be able to communicate with these multimodal approaches. So here's a rationale for this, this particular district goal. The first thing is that our professional organization, <coughs> NCTV, the National Council of Teachers of English, they actually have a position statement that says we should be doing this kind of work. Um, I'm gonna read from the position page where it just says that literacy has always been a collection of cultural and communicative practices shared among members of particular groups. As society and technologies change, so does literacy. Because technology has increased the intensity and complexity of literate environments, the 21st century demands that a literate person possess a wide range of abilities and competencies, many literacies. These literacies are multiple, dynamic, and malleable. And it goes on. Um, but another rationale for this goal is that college writing expectations are changing. So I also teach um, in Montclair State's uh, Writing Studies Department, and I can tell you, over the last 10 years, the expectations for students have changed. Whereas we used to do five analytical essays with our students, one being a research-based uh, uh, essay, document-based uh, essay, now students do two to three analytical essays, and then they have to compose a multimodal project. Uh, which they actually have to get their technology skills going and uh, represent their ideas through these multimodal frameworks. So I use the software um, uh, piece called uh, eMaze, um, but you could just as easily use the uh, Google Slides uh, <coughs> format that I'm using. So again, this is just a link to the Montclair State website. Uh, because I teach there, I could show you the information that's shared with faculty and just the requirements for the syllabi. Um, that we absolutely have to have a multimodal piece. So another reason why we should have digital argumentation and multimodal uh, presentations uh, is because the research says that it's important as well. So this particular book, Argument in the Real World, is a book that I've been reading through, and luckily we were able to partner with Montclair State and get an action research grant where we received $1,500 uh, con to continue this work, and we're we actually purchased uh, copies of the book for everyone in our action research committee. There are six members. Sue Gans is in the audience. She's one of the members as well, the supervisor of the social studies department. So um, all of the teachers in the, the, the well, in so many things, right? Um, in the middle, in the high school, have uh, access to the first chapter. Let me check mine. 
<laughs> Sorry. I know it's not in the media. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be too self-serving here, but... <laughs> <laughs> not at all. No. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. Um, so I, I wrote a blog uh, for the NCTE um, page, and I learned so much from that particular experience. First of all, I learned about the blog genre. Um, I learned that you have to chunk your information differently. It's not like writing an essay. Um, I also learned that hyperlinks are incredibly important. So the information that we hyperlink, that's you know when you uh, click on a particular word and it'll take you to a different page, is so important. Depending on what you hyperlink, it could totally change the meaning um, of what you want to say. And then the other part is, because it's a blog, it's online. You have a, an audience of the entire world. Um, so that was really fun, just having that experience in terms of publishing and getting a lot of feedback from people all over the world. Again, this was the rationale for um, our particular goal. So I just want to talk a minute about the challenges that we have, because we do have quite a few. One is we have to make sure that we keep our work um, standards aligned. Okay? Again, that's another one of our district goals. But we don't want these pieces to be fluff pleasant presentations, right? Instead, we want to look to some of the goals, uh, the standards in terms of determining importance, uh, inferring uh, from the text, uh, being able to synthesize across several different texts. These are standards that we have to keep sort of in the forefront and make sure that we uh, are reminded of them or mindful of them when we're creating these assignments and tasks. The other is the fact that we need to clarify this digital genre. So one of the reasons why our students are so successful on, let's say, uh, a particular standardized test is because they're very aware of the different genres in which they're tested. Um, when we do narrative work, we do all narrative reading. We look at mentor texts that really um, showcase some of the skills of great narrative authors. And then we do narrative writing. So the students know that we study the elements of plot that might happen in a good narrative, and then when the students go to write their own narratives, they draw that story mountain, and they begin pre-writing on that particular mountain. Uh, when we're composing a literary analysis essay, and we have to compare and contrast two works, we realize that we have to create a T-chart, begin with our boxes and bullets, and really start to compose our paragraphs in, in, a, in a structured way. Um, all that goes to say that when you're looking at digital literacy, let's say creating a blog, some of those things that I mentioned before are very different. So we have to make sure that as we keep this goal moving forward, that we make sure our students are able to strategically recognize which genre they're working in. Uh, and they're, be, they're able to know their audience enough to either write a narrative, a, a literary analysis, or possibly go into that digital uh, format. Uh, another challenge is access to computers. Um, you know, we're really moving forward uh, uh, in all of the departments. I could speak for uh, in the English Language Arts Department in grade six with the Achieve 3000 initiative. You know, that takes a lot of computers in terms of matching our kids to those computers where they have to be uh, interacting with the computer as part of their lesson work. Uh, we have level set assessments where um, students get an online assessment of their reading level, their lexile, and that's going on through grades seven and eight as well. Not to mention the you know, bevy of different um, uh, activities and projects that are going on just out of good practice you know, within the school. So you can imagine now creating this digital literacy piece, just making sure that we can match students with computers so that they're able to do a lot of that good work. So what is our current reflective practice? So in our department, it starts with the department collaboration. We want to make sure that we're looking at research-based best practices, and we look at those and see how they apply to our classroom context. I want to share an example of a lesson that we looked at in the middle and high school English department meeting. So um, this is the same sentence written three different times. The difference is that for each of the sentences, it's hyperlinked to a different page. So the lesson is that as you read through each sentence, you complete this graphic organizer. How is number one different? How is number two different? How is number three different? To really see how tremendously different the sentence can be based upon your hyperlinks. 
Okay, so this is a lesson that we worked through with teachers so we could sort of get that idea going first. And then we're going to share it with students because when we ask them to share hyperlinks, we don't want them to do it randomly. We want them to be very thoughtful about where they're actually linking their information. Um, this is a, a, a nuance to the digital literacy field. So um, we do a lot of work with MLA, citation, and APA, and that's incredibly important, especially when students are writing academic papers. But in terms of digital literacy, there's a lot less um, direct citation of the text because there's an expectation that you're going to put in tons of these hyperlinks that are going to go directly to the pages, and that almost serves in some instances as your citation. So um, just a real quick one, if I look at the, uh, the school lunch link, in this first instance, it's linked to a national school lunch program. If I go back to it again, it's linked to an opinion piece, the problem with your child's school lunch. If I go back to it again, It's linked to more of a cultural piece. Look at lunch as it uh, might be represented in different countries around the world. You can imagine just with that one hyperlink how very different um, the sentence could actually be portrayed. Um, we actually borrowed this activity from the multimodal um, argument uh, book that we were studying as a department. Um, another part of our department collaboration is looking through uh, various department resources. So these are all three resources that we've been um, perusing. One is commonlit.org, another one is Newzella, which will be working with the social studies department uh, within the next month or so, and the other one is readworks.org. The thing about each of these um, three resources is that you're able to differentiate um, the text. So uh, they are organized by grade level, by read le reading level, by theme. Um, so you can imagine how amazing it would be, um, something like we did with our Achieve 3000, but now we can do it uh, across the board with all of our students, to actually take an article, know our students' reading level, and then provide that article at the student's just right reading level so that everyone could access the test and comprehend. <coughs> So that when we go to do that um, deeper work of analyzing the text and evaluating the text, everyone comprehends and we're able to move on. The reading never becomes the issue. Okay? Um, a, a lot of times, too, you can use these sources to enhance students' reading. Remember, uh, you know, if you continue to read at your just right level, you're, you're getting a chance to employ a lot of those reading strategies so that you can move your reading level up. Okay, so um, just to show you commonlit.org very quickly, um, this is what it looks like. So you can go to a library of resources. Um, I could browse by, let's say, grade level. <coughs> and um, <coughs> I have access to a bunch of texts. Again, I'm going to look at my district curriculum, see what the thematic focus is, um, try to make nonfiction connections to um, some of the fiction, fictional works that we're reading as well. Um, but again, you can see the advantage of students having access to these computer-based platforms just so that they can practice reading. Um, our teachers are very aware that um, when we're teaching the students to read on the, the page, um, the reading strategies a lot of times are going to be very different than when they're reading on the computer screen. You know, they can't post it um, or bookmark a, um, a computer screen, but they can annotate. Right? They can highlight and um, annotate, and they can take notes in very specific ways. Um, so we also do shared lesson work. So uh, I just put a couple examples to jog my memory, but in grade six today, I was able to work with um, a particular teacher um, at uh, TJ Middle School who was asking her students to do a personification poem um, that contributed to some kind of mood. Um, as a result, we were able to think through this digital literacy um, goal, and I'm going to go back into her classroom, and we're going to look at the idea of inserting pictures that represent that mood next to the poems on a big Google Classroom sheet so that we can publish it for the entire class. 
Um, just remember that we're going to be very um, thoughtful about which pictures that we choose. We're not just going to choose a very literal connection, like that's a poem about a tree, choose a tree. We're trying to choose pictures that are going <coughs> to contribute to enhancing the mood um, of the particular poem that the students authored themselves. So that's an example of a lesson. Another one is I am going in to work with um, a bunch of grade 10 classes, and uh, we'll be working on creating blogs within that classroom as a culminating assignment. Again, the advantage of doing these things is we um, create these lessons in our very unique Fairlawn classroom context, and then we're able to publish them and share them with the whole department so people can look at them, reflect on them, and think about how they might use them in their own classroom. Uh, Interesting thing, I had a grade 8 teacher who saw the uh, district goal and wanted to do the blog uh, for his SGO. And a lot of uh, teachers are using um, digital literacy and multimodal presentations in their SGOs. But in terms of having our conversation with everything that was going on with this class, we figured out that the blog might not be the right thing for an SGO. However, he could take one of his assignments, for example, where the students were doing a book review, and based upon that book review, he could try to integrate some of the hyperlinks within um, that particular book review and make it a computer-based assignment. So again, that's just an example. We have some choices to make as a department as we go down the line. Do we want to continue to sort of like pepper the curriculum with a lot of these little opportunities? Or do we want to create a specific unit that is um, just, you know, where we're really going to go deeply within to the, the genre? Uh, so that, that is a good segue for our goals. So the goal this year is really just immersion into digital literacy and multimodal argumentation. We're virtually bringing it up every time we meet um, as a department in the middle school and in the high school. Um, from there, we want to make sure that we work together to, let's say, create a sample rubric. So here's a working blog rubric that we're working on within the particular high school. You know we like one through four. Seem to do that with most of our rubrics. So um, again, if you can look at you know the the format, um, the first person point of view, um, having relevant uh, hyperlinks, making sure that we have text features. What's cool is if you look along the right side, you see uh, what it would look like if um, the blog was created at the highest level, right? That um, the paragraphing accentuates the ideas that the um, public audience um, is, is uh, being acknowledged so that um, you're conscious of that. Um, the fact that you have uh, links to other blogs or um, important research on the same phenomena uh, within your topic, or let's say having an infographic, not just a picture, but an infographic that really um, takes the information and makes it accessible to the reader. Um, from there, we want to think about our curriculum revision. So what I imagine is right now, we have um, a very deliberate approach to the writing criteria, in the high school especially. Um, we all agree that you know the writing uh, in our classroom should look like this, and here's an example of a ninth grade focus and what they might do in terms of the writing for each of the marking periods. So I imagine this is the kind of thing we have to do around the multimodal presentations in the digital literacy. We have to start by creating that criteria that we think is important for these kinds of projects uh, and just put it out there. From there, we have to sort of think, do we want to sprinkle it in or do we want to have a particular unit? Um, throughout this process, I just want to compliment um, the teachers uh, in the department. They're amazing. So we don't want to tie their hands and require them to do one specific thing. We want to continue to provide, provide these opportunities for them so that they can reflect on them and create um, lessons and activities that are unique to their context. Again, we're all going to look at the same criteria. We're going to have references to sample rubrics. But at the end of the day, I want to be able to support the teacher's ability to differentiate their work. And I think that's why a lot of times we're very successful as a department. Do you have any questions for me? And then I'm going to yield to Nick, who's going to continue with the digital literacy presentation. Okay, is this 
we're using this right now or we're starting to introduce it right now? Uh, we're, we're just immersing into the topic, an immersion into the topic. So um, in particular classrooms, we have teachers are moving very quickly forward with the process. Um, but in every department meeting, we're collaborating on any of the progress that we've made um, and starting to think about what we want to do as a department together <coughs> next year. Oh, so yeah, so like next year we want to get into full and, and all the grade uh, or grade six uh, middle school and high school is that what we're looking at or definitely sec secondary middle and high school yeah. yeah we have to um, yeah. if you look because you know the goal is to have our students ready to let's say go into that college writing course um, so if we're going to do that well we have to start the trajectory of skills in grade six so that we can sort of figure out how we're going to make that uh, more sophisticated and get them there thank you. Yeah. A two-part question, I guess it goes to Dr. Palestas. We're introducing this, immersing this within uh, the English department. Do we see this being done also in the other departments, social studies? Mm -hmm. I think in particular social studies. So and much of what we do in the district that is exemplary is based on the concept that, that we write across the curriculum and in as many curriculum areas as possible. <coughs> one library. So, absolutely. So one of the reasons why our Achieve 3000 program worked in a lot of districts it fails is because we work together across the department. So um, grade six teachers use Achieve 3000 in language arts in the first marking period. They use it in literature connections in the second marking period. And then they use it in social studies in the third marking period. Um, in order to do that, we did summer planning together uh, in both uh, departments where teachers chose particular articles that are re relevant to the units of study. And we also had to work on creating these research simulation tasks. Uh, in our middle school in particular, students are doing two essays, research essays. One that started in the uh, Literature Connections course taught by the English teacher, and then after they've done that, they do a second one with the Social Studies teacher. And we um, are go we're going to be having a joint department meeting in November where we're going to talk about, um, about New ZLA, and then that's going to segue into um, Social Studies where we are going to bring in more of the digital literacy working you know, within our department, but also uh, many of the social studies with English teachers collaborate on multiple projects and lessons, and we see that as kind of a great starting point for that also, you know, at the middle school and high school level. Okay, I, I, actually, there's, there's two additional of those to you as well. The other one is, are we going to implement some kind of a curriculum starting in grade K and then work our way up? because more and more digital or more and more computers are being used in the lower grades. So are we going to start looking into our curriculum for that and building up? In terms of the digital literacy, yes. yes. You'll see some examples of that when Nick does his presentation. You know, this initiative, as Gary indicated, is dependent upon other factors as well. One is the accessibility to the technology. So I think that what we need from a systemic point of view is as we move forward and we look at developing the next budget is to take a look at how can we support the technology needs of our youngest kids and then, and then moving up as well because that needs to run parallel. Now what's important about the skill, skill base here is how students react to it. And I, I was going to ask you about student responses. But you will also find that what's happening in education across the country is that there is a significant collaboration and infusion of technology into the social sciences, into just all fields, in language arts, into the world languages as well. But I do see this as something that will grow up. And it's important for us, however, to jump into this now, because if we look at what colleges say about digital literacy, now, if we are not moving in this direction, then we will be producing traditional English students who will have some difficulty making that adjustment. So this is a good exposure to that, lit that form of literacy on the collegiate level, but also on the level of work. What we're hearing from the business communities across the country is that it's not just reading and writing anymore. It's access through the media to skills, and that, that is a particular sub subset that 
I think all of our students need to be prepared with as well. So this is pretty far reaching. We're looking at it in its infancy <coughs> right now. It's been very, very well guided by Gary, but when you think of the implications of this moving forward, it really is very, very significant because we are going through a revolution in American <laughs> education, but in our culture as well. Okay, and uh, I'm not going to, uh, you want to say something? Oh, I just wanted to jump in real quick on that point. In elementary technology, um, especially grades three, four, and five, we do talk about digital citizenship and are beginning to talk about digital literacy. Mm -hmm. And Gary and I had actually had a conversation about that, um, you know, once to see how this year goes, but then bringing in the elementary tech teachers at those, you know, that, th that teach the third, fourth, and fifth grade <coughs> levels and really seeing, you know, what those middle school kids need and then supporting that in those grades going forward. So there are plans for that as well. Fortunately, I, I also supervise the middle school and high school librarian. And so as a media literacy department, Sue was kind enough to share all the lesson work of our um, elementary tech teachers. And we're looking through that just to see what the opportunities can be for those <coughs> librarians. So the challenge is where do they want to do the one lesson that's going to hit all of the students, which is sometimes time consuming, versus where do they want to create the lesson and um, work with teachers so that the teachers could um, integrate it into something that makes sense. Not to just do like some media literacy lesson, but to look at what they're actually doing in the curriculum and you know put it in a, a very specific place. Okay. The, the last question. I'm assuming that we're we're also going to be doing the ELL and the special. Uh, need students as well with this. My other question is, is when we are hiring new teachers, how are we evaluating during that critical period of time of the interview that they know how to do digital literacy? Mm -hmm. well, it's part of the interview process. We also have our anyone who's a candidate for a position in the district do a demonstration lesson. And so that's a high priority for us. And as we prepare candidates for demonstration lessons, we're looking at, show us how you can do this. What are your skills in the field of technology? Thank you. I could just say, in terms of our track record, most of our um, recent hires are a lot of times leading the department in terms of our technology initiatives. So we're, it's, it's working. Yeah. Totally, to totally uh, sidetracked from the language arts piece, but uh, I observed the math teacher tonight, uh, special education math at the middle school. And she used technology in probably three or four different forms of her lesson that just blew me away. That was just so impressive to see how she was using that technology in a 40-minute lesson. That was a, just a great way to start on Monday morning. <laughs> what grade was that? That was uh, seventh grade. Please. I was, I was actually going to ask about the technology piece because I think that uh, we need to maybe put something in the middle school if we do the houses like a rotation or something where, but clearly you're talking about it. That was going to be my question because I think we need to start teaching them how to do these things because you don't, you don't just know how to do the hyperlinking. Somebody has to show you how to do that. So and even. I think it's really important to you that the language arts teachers are driving the digital literacy piece because it's so connected to reading strategy and writing strategy um, that they usually don't have the you know uh, perspectives that can integrate those things. Right, but but my my thought is just that it should be being taught in a like a technology course yeah. so that when they go to either English or history or math they know how to do those things and the English and math and history teachers aren't showing them how to do those things because they're coming ready to be able to put hyperlinks <coughs> in a document or be able to make a, you know Google Slides or a PowerPoint kind you know Spretzi or whatever it is like that they know that they have those skills they take it with them because the English teachers <coughs> teaching English they shouldn't have to teach you know how many words should go on a PowerPoint slide you know context. Jeff? Yeah. Um, when, uh, I'm glad uh, Dr. Bless has brought it up. The idea for, for that it seems like there might be some support needed from the board in terms of um, making sure that we have the, the right amounts of technology for all our students. So I look forward to supporting that. So I wanted to throw that out there. Um, the other question is, how early do you plan on supporting teachers in terms of their training. Now, I understand that the younger teachers are coming in with this because it's, it's more natural <coughs> for them, but I, I would 
I would like to see or t to know what we're going to do for the more veteran teachers who it is not natural f to, in terms of not only be able to use it, but to be able to bring it to them in such a way that they're comfortable enough to be creative as well, not just kind of saying, all right, I got to do this, because typically that's what happens when technology comes in with veteran teachers. While they're excellent teachers, it's not native to them. So is there planning in progress for that? And what's going on with making sure that our teachers can use this? Because this is great, unless they're all comfortable. I mean, I can say that we use Google Classroom as a department, so it's not just used uh, by teachers to drive the <coughs> instruction uh, within their classes, but we use it for professional learning. So um, we have a high school and a middle school Google Classroom um, piece that goes out to the teachers so that we could share best practices and quick emails um, and links. Um, but more than that, um, hopefully I've shown that we're constantly collaborating and I'm continue trying to model um, a lot of the things that we would like to have go on within the particular classrooms. I think that's that's a really good start. In, in, let me, may I follow up? Uh, in terms of that though, will, will it eventually be an expectation for teachers in, and again Mark alluded to this, in, within their evaluation, is this an expectation for them to be able to do that? If not, it, it will kind of be a ding on their record or on their evaluations? Um, I could say that I absolutely would support teachers uh, in their work with digital literacy. And it's part of the strong model being technology proficient and so we do expect to see technology being infused into lessons but it's not just you know using um, a smart board like a glorified whiteboard right, right. it's like really uh, integrating meaningful technology applications into the classroom okay um, and so what they've done in recent years with professional development plans is they have made it a school focus and so what used to be on the district level, now every individual building has to create a professional development plan. And what most of the principals do is they, <coughs> they survey their staff to find out what do you need to do. And technology comes up over and over again, so you will see a lot of technology um, turnkeying going on within the individual buildings after school, before school, during faculty meetings and department meetings, where those that are more proficient we ask to share with those that might not have those native skills, as right. you said. Yeah. Thank you. Mayor. <clears throat> this is one thing I can speak to as a former employee, and that is one of the strong points of Fail One has been professional development and has been the ability to introduce to those of us who uh, came from a different time, <laughs> you know. Um, to, to uh, train us and bring us on board. And it's always been done in such a way as to never have anyone feel threatened or ever have anyone feel um, they're going to be judged by the level of proficiency. Uh, that simply isn't the environment in which our professional development is done. And it's not the environment in which any new um, uh, programs have ever been introduced in fail on so I mean I can really speak to that having worked here 29 years and having seen a lot of changes so it's always been a delightful process any other questions for Gary uh, Dave um, I, I just from, from the blog point of view I guess my question Two questions, and I'm not sure if I'm jumping the gun and I'm more the technology side, but one, in terms of like the hyperlinks and deciding where to link and a lot of stuff out there looks accurate, might not be accurate. How do you teach kids to differentiate or is there something in place to teach them? I mean, those are three great articles, but there yeah. might be on subjects that might not be as clear cut, might be harder to differentiate between the news and they're calling fake news now. <laughs> 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 My first question, so I'm just curious about that. Great question. So I guess start at like a uh, very um, uh, minimal level. That lesson that I'm doing with the sixth grade teacher, um, we're going right on to um, the Google platform, and after the students type their article, um, we're looking in this sort of picture mode that's right within the Google space, um, just so that we can make sure that we're using pictures that aren't copyrighted, um, especially if we want to publish our pictures uh, on the, the, the wider. Web. Um, the other piece is, again, 
uh, an important challenge in terms of making sure our students are able to see what's appropriate in terms of their resources. Uh, and that's something that our uh, librarians are actually working on to make sure that we support. They do lessons uh, when the students come into grade six uh, to make sure that students are able to look at websites to make sure that um, they're the kind of websites that they would like in, let's say, a uh, document-based um, essay. Uh, we have to do more of that work for them to now think about the kinds of sites that they would hyperlink within their blog, um, granted, but um, we're, we're definitely aware of that, and it's a really good question. I guess the next question more of a, might be more of a technology question, but at, at a certain point, I guess when we get to high school, do you start teaching them about like search engine optimization and those kinds of things when it comes to links? And, yeah, um, I could say that our um, uh, high school librarian actually has uh, a professional learning goal where she's trying to increase the amount of databases and hits that are used within the high school. Um, so she does work in two different ways. She does a common lesson for all ninth grade students um, as they enter the high school. And then she's doing uh, more differentiated support for the teachers who bring the classes into the library to do more research-based lessons. So it's, it's, again, that's a good beginning to um, <coughs> sure. Any other questions? Thank you, Gary. Oh, sorry, sorry. Gary, I'm sorry, I had one. Sorry. sorry. I just want to ask, like, is there going to be more upgrade to, like, the, um, the connections at the schools? And my daughter brings a, a Microsoft Surface to school, and she said sometimes she has to use, like, her hotspot because it's not a, it's not, you can't get, can't get on. We're always uh, looking to expand. <laughs> we just have to figure out how much it's going to cost to do so. But it is, it is a need. And I think the real key with the technology that we have is providing flexibility. And, uh, you know, yes, we need to do more. Gary, I had a, a quick question. I know the teachers have responded very favorably to this. But are you getting any, what kind of feel do you have for the student response? Um, I... I'm going to see more because I'm actually doing some of the lesson work within the classes. But uh, my guess is this is the first time they're doing this kind of work very strategically in terms of the multimodal theory. Like they've done presentations where they've used Google Slides, but they haven't really gone down to the level of thinking of, let's say, what font that they use to represent mm -hmm. a particular word. Um, it's, sorry if I repeat the story, but when I was in college, I remember using a Comic Sans font for a paper, and my English professor said, what, what are you doing? And I was like, let your word, use Times New Roman, that's, the, that's what you're supposed to do. Let your words speak for your essay, don't try to use the font. And now it's funny that years later, here I am, teaching a lesson on font, um, because the font that you can use can actually contribute to the meaning in a presentation, maybe not in an academic essay. Um, so I think in that respect, that's what I'm really looking forward to see the students making these thoughtful um, decisions because I think it's going to contribute to more meaningful um, multimodal pieces, not just that literal connection, but thoughtful. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, what, what I was most impressed with is the collaboration um, between not only your department, Gary. Gary? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. What I was most impressed with was the collaboration, not only within your department, but within other departments as well. And I always think that that is um, the strength, one of the strengths of, of Fairlawn is working cross departments um, in almost everything you guys do. So, thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, Learning Ally. <coughs> Learning Ally is... Um, is a new program that we have. Uh, we're rolling with the free theme tonight. Mm -hmm. Learning Ally was something that was uh, a grant that we were able to access here in Fairlawn. And what it does is it allows us to address the digital literacy goal for Fairlawn, but also while addressing the different reading levels for all our students. Well, oftentimes as teachers, we may have 10 different reading levels in the classroom, five different reading levels. It could be a seventh grade class. We may have some students on seventh grade level, fifth grade level, third grade level. Uh, Gary and I met today. We spoke about um, exactly what Mary and Jeff were alluding to, about professional development, as well as uh, giving the teacher the tools to work with. This is all great 
unless we give them the actual tools to work with the technology as well as the professional development. So it's a three-piece model, whereas one, we give you the resources, but also we give you the other resources, which is the actual technology and the professional development to support it as well. Um, with that being said, Learning Ally is one of those tools. So I'm going to show you uh, Learning Ally and some of the features that it has. What we did was we um, this rolled out as a reading intervention for any of our students that we could implement in the classroom. What I love about this is that it's web-based and it's app-based. So you could, I have a Learning Ally <coughs> app on my phone. Actually. I have a Learning Ally app on my phone, on my iPad. You could have it on a Chromebook. You could have it set on your browser. You could have it anywhere that you could access Learning Ally. Also, you do not always need Wi-Fi. So if we download Learning Ally onto your iPad, your iPhone, whatever it is, and we download a book to it, once that book's on there, you don't need Wi-Fi to access it. Another, another really nice thing about Learning Ally, a lot of times you hear audio books, and when you're hearing audio books, it's very remote, it's very robotic. Uh, this is not. These are, are taped with uh, human voices, humans narrating it. So uh, it gives it that sense of, um, you know, like you're really listening to a movie or a story or something along those lines. Um, what, are, what the teachers are able to do, they could manage their students. I said, this is a demo account. I, I would love to show you my account, but every student and every teacher pops up here. So out of respect for them and confidentiality, you're not going to see that. Um, you can see all the students here. The teacher would just click on the students in their class. Just give this a minute. Properly, but if you went to pick a book for the students in your class, uh, if you were to pick a book in here, say you pick Wonder, so that was one of our books. Is that one of our books? One of our novels? Could be. Right. Yeah. I wanted the mole and the mouse for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I wanted the other one for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> 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 See, getting your right hair look. There you mouse go. and a mole. There you go. <laughs> uh, here you can see that it's human, voice text, and the HD is human. If you were to add this to your bookshelf, the teacher, so this is, e this is all the teacher has to do. They go in, and then they can pick Adam Wilson's reading this book. Mm -hmm. These three kids, now they're all assigned that. I can go to another novel, and they can assign three different novels to three other students in their class. The students can go sit at their computer, they can put their headphones on, and they can listen to it. Everybody can be working on their reading level. They are differentiating the instruction to the student's reading level rather than the other way around, where you have 10 different students reading on different levels, and you're trying to run around, trying to make everybody <coughs> needs at the same time. This is a great way to break up the novelty of the task in the classroom where you can work for maybe 30 minutes, whatever it is, 10 minutes, go on to Learning Ally. But not only that, but you can also assign it to students at home. Another thing that's great about this is that you have a lot of resources. So you do not have to reinvent the wheel all the time. You can graphic or 11,000 different graphic organizers, 11,000 plus, you can do it. Nick, yes. what grade level does this go down this to? This starts from kindergarten all the way up. So we have students here at Edison utilizing this. We have students district-wide utilizing this. All our schools enrolled in this program. Of course. Mm -hmm. I just bought something for us. <laughs> You're paying for it. So, hey, uh, <laughs> put it on my tab. <laughs> so, you have a Venn diagram here. So, you could, you, there's over 11,000 resources for teachers. They do not have to reinvent the wheel. They want to do a Venn di diagram. They want to do a KWL. They can just go right here, print it out, give the students 10 different students in their class, 20 students. Everybody can be working on the same thing, but working on their level, which is really nice, which could often be a struggle at times. Does anybody have any questions about this one, though? So the professional development, I think Mark had asked a question before. Um, somebody we were talking about professional development. We had uh, already the people from Learning Ally come in 
and do a department in service at Warren Point. So every teacher in the room was uh, in service on how to use this feature of Learning Analyze. So that whole building was in service. So the teachers that chose to use it um, are up and running with their classrooms. Some of them obviously took the ball and ran with it more than others um, because it depends on what they're working on. Uh, this may not apply to maybe a science teacher as much as it would apply to an English arts teacher. Um, also, in addition, uh, Gary and I were speaking today about how do we get creative for the rest of our district. We can't just have the person come out every month and do a different building at a different time. So we were talking about possibly doing a webinar. And we thought that would be a great forum. Uh, she's done webinars for us in the past, for us as administrators sent their own. So we thought Learning Ally may be getting all our teachers together for a department meeting or whatever it may be, and they can do a webinar on their own time, and they can learn about uh, Learning Ally. Uh, Nick. Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, like, like you were saying, if you have a classroom with, like, say, six different reading levels, mm -hmm. and the teacher assigns them each a different book to their reading level, for so the teacher, does that teacher have to, uh, evidently has to read all, like, understand? I mean, uh, maybe I'm sounding stupid, no, but... No, Ron, look at it in a different way. Instead of a teacher assigning a novel to students that may be part of their lesson, it could be part of just a positive reinforcement. Everybody in here pick a book on your reading level, and for the last 10 minutes, we're trying to encourage students to read as much as possible. For the okay. last 10 minutes, you pick a book. A lot of students, I ask my nephews, they love I Survive books. Mm -hmm. There you go. All the I Survive books are on here. Okay. Uh, Gary and I, once again, we met earlier today. I think you had said that every novel, 6th grade through 12th grade, he checked against our curriculum and learning an ally, and every novel is on here, which is really nice. But it's not just our uh, novels aligned to our curriculum. There's also a lot of uh, pleasure reading for our students as well. Uh, yeah, no, I, I wasn't trying. I just yeah. say it's a lot on the teacher. I mean, you know, I mean, I know teachers love to read, I, I, you know, but that's Agreed. that's a lot of <laughs> reading. <laughs> doing. However, you as know. I found out as an educator, the more you're prepared, sometimes the easier your <laughs> lessons go. Yes. Um, best not to come in and just try to wing it. Doesn't always work out the best. But when you're prepared, it helps out a lot. So Good sometimes summer. that effort they put in knowing their students' reading level will pay them dividends <clears throat> when they're sitting yes. in the classroom, and it works for all their students. Easier. Their flow. Um, so. Yeah. I do have a question. When you say you assign a kid to their reading level, I just want to know how you how you help the student progress to a higher reading level. Okay. So, like, so, so if I'm at third grade level, how do I get the fourth and fifth? Well, there's so ways of, and you do that through the course of the school year. So there's different reading assessments that we do for students that track their data and see where they're at, so we can know when they would move up and when they wouldn't. However, what I, I want to show you, I, want, I only pulled out one school to give you an idea. And there's no names, but I was really proud of. Uh, Lincrest uh, Elementary School. I'm proud of all the schools, but Lincrest really took the ball and ran with this right now. And you can see on here how many 92 different books were assigned by students. That means students picked themselves in Lincrest. 92 different books. And then 28 books were, were assigned by educators. So that may be to your point. 28 different books were assigned by the educators, and then here 92 books were assigned by students. And then you go over. And you can see total pages read, 543 different pages are read, which doesn't seem like a lot yet, but we really just rolled this out within the last, we started in September. Um, what we did was, as part of giving the teachers the tools to work with, we rolled out Learning Ally, we did professional development for them, and we were able to purchase three Chromebook cards out of the special ed funds uh, as part of addressing reading intervention in the district. And we purchased three different Chromebook cards Three schools that really jumped in with Learning Ally, and uh, three of those schools now have the Chromebook cards. But we also worked with technology, because we did not want our technology department to not be able to access, to your point, how do I get the, the students don't have access to the internet or whatever it was. So we worked with them and said we're going to roll out one card in each school building. Now that those three cards were just delivered last week, and Lincrest has already hit the ground running with it, uh, we're going to look to purchase more cards. We're going to purchase one card for each school, and then those teachers can share those cards amongst other teachers, and hopefully this continues, the ball keeps rolling in the right direction. I also just want to add that obviously this is a great resource for us, but we have our curriculum in place as well. So it's really through the skills work and the other work being done by the teachers during our block of literacy time that we really help them to improve their skills as readers. Um, and that's how they are able to continue to progress through those different reading levels. And as Mr. Norcia commented, you know, we do periodic 
um, check-ins and updates and benchmark assessments to make sure that we know where the children are in their reading level. And I can see Gary's just <laughs> to yeah. say something. So. I mean, it's our philosophy that we want to give our students a lot of choice and we want to guide them um, towards books in which they're going to be successful. But from there, um, we absolutely make sure that we confer with students um, so that when they are reading a particular text, um, we're going to listen to them read, and then we're going to use that um, reading time as a way to research in terms of listening to what, how they're reading and to provide a strategy um, that would support them to move up to the trajectory. So we study the book called Fountains and Fundell's uh, Continuum, where there are particular characteristics um, outlined for each of the reading levels. And then if the teacher, let's say, is working with the student at level E, um, that teacher should be very aware of the characteristics of book at F um, so that when they're listening to the student read at E, they can also provide strategies for the student to move up. Our teachers are also getting a lot better at not only having individual conferences, but looking across the room and having more flexible groupings of students who have um, similar goals. We call those strategy groups where we can pull multiple kids uh, and um, we also like to have a lot of quick complement conferences with our students as well, just so we can get as many opportunities to work with students in an individualized way um, across the week. But it, it, it really does work. There's um, a lot of webinars and resources here, and they're always there, and they're always free. So that if you miss one, you can always jump on. They always replay them. They're very big on addressing dyslexia, um, and this is one of their forefronts, which is really nice about it. With the books, are they listening to the books and looking at the words at the mm -hmm. same time? And you could, okay. And you could slow the speed. You could okay. make the speed faster. You could highlight words. You could make notes in there and type it. You could flag a page if you really wanted to. So there's a, a lot of really great cool features. Like I said, I would actually have to go into a student. <laughs> Well, it was this that. stuff when I was going to school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you had, you had cliff notes. That's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick question. Is this similar to a program we used to have where the kids would go on the computer in the classroom a couple of years ago in elementary school? Um, um, reading reading Izzy Izzy or Raz yeah, kids? Yeah, Raz, Raz kids, Raz yeah, and they loved it. So, yeah. and, but this sounds like so much better, you know. So this is even good. better because it yeah. has the live reader that that's really contributes great. to developing the fluency. Same question, but oh. I, I wonder if it was similar to IXL where you sign in from home. Can students sign in from home? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, yes, yeah, so I'd like to invite Lauren Gimon, who is the supervisor of math and business, uh, to come for, and career education, uh, along with Karen Rood and Brian McCourt, um, teachers from the high school, to present on a, a new course that they would like to propose for next year for the high school. <laughs> yeah, if someone, if someone moves, it will go on. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Natalie had mentioned, I'm here with Karen Rood, who currently teaches AP Computer Science A and Robotics at the high school, as well as Brian McCourt, um, who teaches Visual Basic, which is kind of an introductory course to computer programming. And we're here to um, propose to you a new course um, that College Board is offering um, called AP Computer Science Principles. Um, Karen had come to me um, and was really excited about this. She goes to several roundtables during the year, um, and Mr. McCourt now is also attending those roundtables. Um, basically, North Jersey schools have discussions about um, what AP classes as well as computer classes that they have going on in their schools. Um, so Karen's been getting some feedback on some other schools in the area that started this course last year. Um, and as Dr. Plestis always says, when you want to make a decision, you think about it. Um, we wanted to hear what other schools had to say, how it rolled out in their schools, um, some pros and cons to the course. So we're going to pass out um, some information, and then, and then you guys. So if you guys want to get started. So AP Computer Science Principles is the newest AP class offered by the College Board. And it's a very, very interesting class, uh, which can be an adjunct to uh, AP Computer Science A, or uh, it might be a course that a student will take without taking AP Computer Science A. Um, it's designed, uh, as indicated here, to be an introductory course. It is equivalent to a first semester college introductory course in computer science, not necessarily a first semester programming course in college, because it is a course that explores all aspects of computing, including, as indicated on the handbook, that you have the global impact of computers, the internet, um, cybersecurity, general discussion of algorithms, lots of very interesting and exciting topics that we believe will be interesting to a wide variety of students. Um, the, um, the course, if you look at the third bulleted item, uh, Fundamentals of Computing, we will be teaching the students some programming. Um, <coughs> students will talk in great detail about data and how to analyze it and how different computing innovations use that data, um, how computers in, in, in impact uh, people in society and the uses of computers, and a very, very interesting course with lots of great information in it that I said, as I said, I believe would be very appealing to a wide variety of students. I also think it's important to note, too, that a lot of the information we heard in our first presentation tonight really applies to our course. Yes. So a student needs to know how to find good resources, which is something that, you know, that we really can't spend the time in our course. They're going to be expected to know how to find a resource, how to know if it's um, factual or if it's quote unquote fake news or something of that nature. Um, so I, you know, it goes back to the whole thing that we're cross curriculum and everything of that nature. This is also, um, if I was a student, this is a course that I would want to take because you're touching upon all the different topics that are important in the world nowadays. Uh, number one, one of the topics is cybersecurity. And I think that is something that all of our students need to learn and fully understand in today's day and age. Um, and we'll touch on it on the next slide, it's on the, the handout. But this is not a computer programming course. Um, and we'll talk more about that. It's a course that includes programming as one of its topics, but it's 
not the same thing as, and we'll talk about this also, it's not the same as a computer science ed. Two entirely different curriculums. Uh, the first thing all the way uh, to the left, we have our, our topics that would be covered. They call them the big ideas. So we'll talk about the global impact, the internet, programming, algorithms, data and information, abstraction, and creativity. Um, this is the, the real big part that we wanted to stress tonight, what the AP, uh, the AP exam consists of. Um, this course is very much different than all of the other AP courses that are uh, curriculums uh, and all the departments for, as of right now offer. Um, the students really begin their AP exam on the first day of school. Um, they have two components. So one component is the graded portfolio, um, and that's 40% of the AP exam. So there's two parts. One that's a computing innovation, and then the other one is a creation of code. It's called the create test. So when Karen and I were at the round table a couple weeks ago, we learned about um, from one of the readers of the AP exam, what they're really looking at for a computing innovation. They told us that everybody, or the majority of the students were looking at an iPhone, but that's not what they wanted them to concentrate on. They wanted them to concentrate on the lens or the camera, and they talk about how that innovation is important and what they, all the different aspects of it. So they're really, they're teaching the students how to break down all these little problems and see how all the little components really come together to form the phone itself. The graded portfolio um, in the uh, explore test, when the students are asked to explore computing innovation, they have to create um, a video, they have to create a digital poster, they have to write text, um, the text has to be documented, the research has to be done with current material, the material is not permitted to be more than one year old. Um, and so this is something that uh, we're going to make good use of our school librarian for, for helping students to um, do that research properly, because it is a very large part of the exam. And then the create task, of uh, the creation of code, that's something that they'll also be working on during class. Um, the course is really different than AP Computer Science A. Um, AP Computer Science A is a course that a student who's interested in majoring in any field of computer science in college needs to take. Um, and we've had many students who've gotten in contact with me after they've graduated from Carolyn to say that had they not taken AP Computer Science A, they would have had a very difficult time in the computer science class in college. So that's an excellent course for students interested in programming. AP Computer Science Principles is for a wider variety of students. Um, students who are interested in understanding um, some general concepts of computing, maybe a student who isn't quite sure what they want, I might be interested in computer science, I might not be. So this is a good course to get them uh, to get their feet wet. Um, a Computer Science A, very structured course. Students must program in Java. Uh, a Computer Science Principal students can use any language that they want. Um, it's their choice. A Computer Science A, programming intensive. The type of programming we do in Computer Science A is very different than what will get done in the principal's class. And even the College Board indicates that the principal's class is not intended to be a program course. It's intended to be an immersion in many aspects of computer science. So they are very different courses. Um, I don't believe that the order of the courses really matters. I think students could take them in any order. Uh, they could take them both in the same year as their schedule permits. And again, they are distinctly different courses with two distinctly different types of AP exams. One of the other things we, uh, we learned about too with other schools is there are um, a variety of different um, prerequisites that schools have. Uh, some of the schools were talking about having a humanities prerequisite. Um, so we learned, we learned quite a bit in terms of um, what we think this this class is geared towards, um, and we think that this fits uh, very well with the types of students that we have um, at Fairland. 
And really, most of the teachers who taught this course were talking about how they could expand on this, and this could be a two-year course. Um, because the topics that are covered are so critically important, and they don't really have the time to touch on, uh, you know, in terms of the length, the specific information. Um, but I really think that this is something that our students um, will thoroughly enjoy. I've gotten a little bit of um, interest from students when I've talked to them about it. I think this class would be very well received by our student body. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to teach this. Brian is also. It includes a lot of the things that I wish I had time for in computer science A, but I really don't have time for because that curriculum is packed. Um, so as I said, I'm looking forward to teaching this very much. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Yes. In your conversations with the other districts, was there any downside to this course that they uh, no. did the not? the only things that, um, and this is not even a downside, it's just things to watch out for. Um, the schools tended to say it's really not a good course for freshmen because freshmen don't have enough uh, writing experience and they're not really sophisticated enough for this. Um, I mean, other than that, there was really no downside. The round table that we went to, there were 30, 35 teachers there from a wide variety of schools. They were all very excited about it. They all enjoy it. They've got good enrollment. Um, I, I don't see any, any downside in this class. So what grades are we going to offer this in? Um, and, and what is the maximum enrollment for a course like this? Is there one? Um, per class, it's 20 because there's 20 computers in the lab. Yes. Um, currently this year, we have two courses of AP Computer Science A, um, but we think that some of those kids that maybe took Computer Science A would have taken principles instead of A. Um, some of the kids are realizing how intensive the Computer Science A programming course is, um, and I think some of those kids would have liked the opportunity to have this course instead. Um, that would have been a little bit less um, stringent with the with the type of language um, used during the programming as well as the requirements of the course. And what grade is that being offered to? Though, uh, AP Computer Science A is offered to grades 10 through 12. No, the new one. Um, and this as well, we would be looking at offering it for grades 10 through 12. Well, there is isn't. Um, well, we, it's not considered a programming course. There is still a programming component. Right. So we think it's very important that they take the introductory course. So that will just introduce them to, and what we have looked at and spoken with other uh, teachers is what we show in our intro class is more than enough for the programming component. Our visual basic, so kids take, um, we offer different PFLs at the high school, so one of the, one of the uh, PFL classes that we offer is half your PFL and then half your visual basic. What is PFL? Uh, uh, personal financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Yep, so it's a required course by the state of New Jersey. And a lot of students too that Karen had last year, uh, two of them, that uh, just tested <coughs> this course uh, with the testing coordinator, Mr. Hicks. They both said to both of us that they suggest you take the course together. That was their personal opinion. Um, but the one student in particular felt as though that the one course, um, taking A uh, in programming, that would really complement the, the principal's course. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, hi. Um, curious. Now, as long as I take the vir virtual basic class. Virtual basic, yeah. Vir vi virtual, I'm sorry. <laughs> virtual basic, I'm sorry. Um, will then there be open enrollment for that? class or could anyone take it? The or only requirement for visual basic is that kids complete algebra one. Okay. So this would be like an AP class that a lot of students who not who wouldn't normally be in AP classes could actually take and get credit for. Absolutely. Okay. My other question is um, when a course is added typically someone else loses. Mm -hmm. So this class wins, who loses? Like what classes are kids not going to take? Is this going to be, like uh, I, I heard you mention, like it's going to be uh, with personal finance, which, you know, 
we've heard things of, of other challenges that that causes for other classes, uh, specifically <coughs> extracurriculars. Um, will this hinder that, or again, just generally, who loses? Um, I don't think anybody loses. I think that right now we have two, like like I said, we have two computer science A courses. Um, I can see that for next year um, with opening this course up. We have four sections of VB PFL. So in those four sections, we probably have 100 kids or so that are taking a visual basic course this year. Um, and usually we get from those 100 kids every year, we get somewhere between 25 to 30 that stay in that computer science A route um, because there's other things that kids want to do and sometimes kids take a visual basic course and they realize, whoa, this is definitely not for me. Um, so I would say that we kind of be, that we would be keeping that, um, I think two computer programming courses probably, maybe one of computer science A and one of computer um, science principles. That's, that's my thought on it. I could be wrong. Um, but I have no doubt, as has happened in other schools, that the principal's class will keep away a little bit at the A class. But I don't think the A computer science A class will go away because there are students that want that intensive program. And I won't allow that course to go away. <laughs> I mean, I've taught that class since 1988, so I'm not about to, I'm not going to let that go. I'll push both. The year I graduated. And, and we, do a, we do a really good job, too. Um, compliments no. to Brian McCourt and Paul Lakina, who teach Visual Basic. Um, having conversations with kids, too, is, I think, really important. Um, talking to the kids about the differences in the classes. What's the difference between the principal's course and the computer science A course? Um, and talking to them about you know what their interest is in the future. We get kids that come in, you know, um, when we do the hour of computer <coughs> school, um, I know kids tell me like right away, in eighth grade, sixth grade, I want to be a computer programmer. I do this stuff at home on code.org. Um, so those kids kind of already know at a young age that they really enjoy the computer science piece. Um, but I like that this course can kind of maybe open the door for kids that you know maybe take BV and they're kind of interested, but they're really you know, not sure if it's something that they really want to pursue. I think this principal's course might like enlighten them and uh, open them up to some some new uh, career pathways. Uh, Ron, uh, I guess similar to what Jeff was saying. One, this is not an elective. Like, if a kid wants to go in to take it, it like um, I know it's an AP course, but I'm saying it's like rather than take another class. And two, what happens if I know what we're saying is that I agree with you. I know kids get into something that I and ain't for me. But <laughs> as times are changing and more kids are getting into technology at a younger age, what happens down the line? I mean, I think it's a great course, but what happens down the line when now we have, you know, 150 kids that want to take these courses? I know it's like looking ahead, which I like right. too. It's like, do we have an idea of what we how we would handle that? Is something that we can, they can bypass, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, I know you got your English, you know, your majors are going to take. Right. Rather than taking something else, they want to, I know they're going to qualify <laughs> to a certain point, but right. do we have a plan for that or something? You know, I mean, I know it's long range, <laughs> but I always um, like to look in the future. Because I'm saying, it is right. changing, becoming, as we're talking here tonight, technology, it's Absolutely. where we're going, so. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, I think I kind of wanted to see how, you know, we put out the feelers this year to see how many kids from Visual Basic, and a lot of times, um, kids want to complete other requirements as well and sometimes save a course. So sometimes a kid takes VB freshman year um, and then sophomore year they want to take their art requirement to kind of get that out of the way so then they might not register for this okay. course until maybe junior year or senior year. Um, so it's hard because Karen teaches kids in grades 10 through 12 in computer science A. So sometimes a kid takes VB freshman year is traditionally when they take the course, sometimes sophomore year. Um, but sometimes they'll have time in between when they take the VB course and the, the A course. Board members, any other <coughs> questions? Audience? Yes. Hi. Uh, your writing component is a big piece of this mm -hmm. curriculum. Yep. So is that full into the graded portfolio portion where it's 40%? Yes. Of, um, yep. And, and that's <laughs> And that's one thing just um, the portfolio piece, the teachers cannot help during that portfolio piece. So this is also a kid 
in this course that really needs to be self-motivated and is able to kind of, you know, after learning the BB stuff, is able to work on their own because during that portfolio time when they're in the lab, the teacher cannot assist the kids with their portfolios at all. When you look at the overall um, as a student, mm -hmm. you look at his overall grades, you're looking at that English grade as well, right? Um, so does that fall into the, do you take that into consideration when, you, when the applications come in? I, I think we would definitely have a conversation about having that included because there is that, that piece in there as well. I'm sure you know the students that are excelling in math and science and that's where they're at, you know, right. and in their English, maybe a little weak. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> to, to take that into consideration. Well, we look at every kid individually, so when kids um, apply for a course, we would take a look at, at each of them. You know, maybe there's a reason why their English grade wasn't as good, or, um, you know, because we do want to make sure that they're prepared for the class, because I think that that's also important, like, that they're meeting the requirements for the course as well. Okay. Another question. So, um, my daughter couldn't take visual basics this year. She had to move out of her class and a whole big mess. But she um, wants to do this for a living. So next year she wants to do, so could she do visual basics and the, um, the P one yeah. together or no? She'll be a uh, sophomore. Yeah, the, the visual basic will be the prerequisite. Oh, so for she'll have to wait another class. year to yes. do. Yes. So if she, she's currently a freshman, so she could take a half year visual basic and a half year PFL as a sophomore, right. and then junior year take the AP computer science course. Right, and then, but she wouldn't, so then senior year she would take the A? Correct, she could do that. Yep. Or if there's one in her schedule, she could take both at the same time. Okay. Yep. <coughs> Jeff, yeah, real quick question. Um, do guidance counselors uh, at the high school do you do, do you present for them also when their new classes, whether it be this one or other ones? Like, how do they get the information to pass on to their to we their? Do. Um, prior kids. to scheduling, we have a meeting with guidance, and all of us talk about our courses. We talk about if there's any changes to anything in our um, you know in our list of courses. Um, we also try to give them ideas of um, courses. If if a kid is showing interest in this, you might want to have them, you know, highlight or notice this course um, that might be good for them in their career path. So, yeah, we do. We meet with them, all of the supervisors as well as um, special ed. Um, we all meet with the, uh, the guidance prior to the kids registering for the courses. Thank you. Did you want, like, a straw boat or anything? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, that would be sure. great. <laughs> Thank you very awesome. much. So Thank you. We appreciate Thank you. your support. Appreciate your support. Anyone else have any any other questions for? Uh, for Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. It sounds good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> so as, as we're kind of changing, I'll just introduce it. All right, we have one more thing. So. Um, so our last presentation of the evening. Hey, guys. Last presentation of the evening is on STEM and STEAM offerings that are actually going on right now in Fairlawn. You will see the all the subject supervisors are here this evening to speak about this topic and we are going to share with you all the places in our curricula that is it's embedded with activities and units and other projects for students to work on from K through 12. It's a you know, STEM has been around for a while, STEAM for a little less uh, time. Well, Steam has been around but a long they've time. Been around, <laughs> they have been around. Sorry, I had to go there. Speaking as <laughs> yes. the truth. Um, for quite a few years. <laughs> and, and the nice part is, if you remember back when we first put into place the dynamic math course in the middle school, that was a really long time ago, and that was really cutting edge. And it wasn't called STEM at that time, but basically it did incorporate components of math and technology and engineering into it. Um, and you will see that there's also a great deal of art in there as well. We now have changed the name of the course to Dynamic Applications because over the years, as we've revised it, it really has taken on more of um, an engineering focus and a technology focus even more so than in the <coughs> past. 
So I'm going to let Ron and Lauren and Sue talk to you about all of those places in our curricula where you can find STEM and STEAM activities. So I'm going to turn it over to you folks. Good evening, everybody. I just uh, I wanted to recognize Mr. Temi, who's included here, here as well. He's uh, been instrumental in getting our new elementary science program off the ground. It's, it's definitely uh, wouldn't be as successful as it is without him. So uh, I wanted to make sure that we do that. Uh, really quick, I just wanted to explain a little bit about what STEAM is, because everybody has a different definition about it. And STEAM is really an educational approach which has to do with breaking down barriers between science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. Um, we've been doing it here in Fairlawn for a really long time, as I mentioned, with dynamic math. Uh, when Ma Ramazavi was here, the science department and the math department, we, we, we've been using TI calculators in both departments for a long time. We've been using veneer equipment in both departments for a long time. So we have this common philosophy, this common approach to analyzing data, to, to what we value in both departments. Um, and now with the integration of engineering, we're kind of continuing that philosophy. Um, and, and that's really what tonight is, is supposed to be highlighting the ways that we've been doing this for the past several years. Um, so we're, we're going to take you through each grade level and sort of highlight the, the interconnectedness of these, these different approaches. Uh, and we'll start with elementary school. Uh, Knowing Science is the new program that we adopted two years ago. It was integrated into K-1-2 last year uh, and 3-4-5 this year. It was piloted last year. And, and STEAM is really integrated into this program all, all the way through. Every single unit, each, each grade level has three units, uh, a life science, an earth science, and a physical science. And each unit has an engineering component. So the students have to design a solution to a problem, be it designing a, a way to, uh, to make an earthquake uh, resistant house uh, by, by designing and building something based on what they've learned about weather and, and climate, for example. Every grade level, every unit has that. They're, they're using art to, to, to draw different diagrams of what they've observed all the way down to kindergarten, and all the way up to fifth grade as well. Uh, Mr. Femi and I have, have met with the REACH teachers over the last couple of years, uh, and, and we, we know that in third and fourth grade, for example, every single student participates with the REACH teachers, and they do engineering and design challenges as well. Uh, they, they do tower building, where they learn about the structural design of the tower, uh, and then they actually shape the tower to see if they can keep it standing. They do toy design projects, they do rainforest design projects, again, connecting weather, climate, and, and what's needed in the rainforest to, to be successful. They do boat building. So that design loop is integrated all the way through every each class. In um, elementary art, so art, uh, which is the A added a little later to uh, STEM, <laughs> but it's always been there. Um, because, you know, when we talk in the art department about STEAM, and you know, the art teachers will say, well, art is STEAM. Because you need to know math. I mean, you can just look at some of the work that we have displayed. Um, you really need to know math in order, especially for some of these that look, I mean, it blows me away, but for proportion, for perspective, you have to know where to put it. Um, you know, science even, and co mixing colors. I mean, you know, I can tell you, and I'm a social studies, not an art person, and as my daughter said when I was helping her with homework, how are you in charge of the art teachers? <laughs> you know, you need to be But, um, you know, uh, you really need to know science for color theory and mixing. So in art, there's something, you know, really kind of our emphasis last year, this year, is just bringing out those connections and making, you know, those connections to the students just more transparent. Um, at the elementary level, and when I was in Warren Point the other day, uh, the art teacher there, and which you'll see the pictures after, works on a 3D art project. So she actually met with Mr. Temi to talk about, well, how does 3D work? So that would be an example of a project they've done, but now let's bring in the science. How does 3D work? You know, talk about it in the art class. You know, watch a little video on it and really kind of understand why you're doing that. Not just, okay, we do it because but to make those connections. You know, so that's one example. Um, in our everyday math program, um, 
you know, it's not a traditional math program. The, the kids are doing a variety of activities. Um, it ties in very nicely with our new science program as well as the kids are using similar manipulatives during the day. Um, in everyday math, one of the things that the kids do are open response questions. Um, it's actually a two-day process and the kids are given some kind of open-ended question. A lot of times, um, a real world, a real world problem. Kids collaborate and think about what they would do um, or how they would go uh, go about approaching a problem. That's also a very STEAM-like activity. It's just having discussions, talking about it, coming up with a plan, all that stuff. Um, and then it, after they've um, completed the lesson, they have a chance to go back to the activity and see what they would change and what would they might keep the same. Um, in, in those things, so that's good. That's part of the design process. You know, keep going around in that, that um, epic wheel of designing and, and reevaluating. Um, in elementary technology, um, you know, it's, we kind of talked about this in all of the presentations, but um, the elementary technology teachers are working a lot more. Last year, we kind of explored it, and this year, especially with coding, using code.org code and other um, resources, but integrating that into the third, fourth, and fifth grade levels. And they really do work closely with classroom teachers on a multi multitude of activities. Um, so that would just be you know, one example there that they do as well. So these are, that's the, yeah, that's the, you can see with the 3D glasses, but the, um, the art project, they were beginning to work on it. So you'll see them in the arts festival. We'll have some, so where the glasses is always. Um, and then these are also some elementary pictures, um, grade three science. Um, grade 5 science and then also the reach um, as you can see the kids working on the engineering design cycle. So in the middle school science program we also just adopted a new program. We're, we're in our second year uh, using the CEPA program which is manufactured by lab aids. The entire program is phenomena based so the students are, are in, in each unit they're trying to apply the content that they're learning to a real life situation like uh, where, where would we build this house in, in the best place that, that it wouldn't get damaged by some sort of storm? Um, that, uh, and then each, each of those, again, just like the elementary program, they're always trying to engineer solutions to problems. So that connection goes through, through the whole program. Um, just like in math, they're using TI Inspires and Vernier for data collection. Uh, they're analyzing data, they're using gizmos to manipulate data on the screen. All sorts of connections between engineering, math, and science. Uh, STEM Club. Um, it's a it's an interscholastic STEM competition. Uh, we've been in, we've been participating in it for three years now at the high school. Last year was the first year we, we participated in the middle school. We actually hosted a competition at Memorial last year. Uh, interscholastic. Multiple schools get together to compete. Uh, last year, the students at Memorial, the, the, the competition at Memorial, they were they were challenged to design a wheelchair ramp that would be able to fold, be put into a chair. So we had a connection to, to the ADA. We had a speaker from the ADA come, the ADA committee. There was a math teacher involved, uh, a dynamic applications teacher was involved, a science teacher was involved, a high school technology teacher was involved, uh, and then TJ is hoping to, to play in that competition this year as well. Both schools competed the last year. Um, so dynamic applications, the kids take two rotations um, per year of dynamic applications. Um, so I had actually written down because I wanted to make sure I, I spoke exactly to what they're doing. Um, in grade six, I wanted to highlight the statistics project. Um, the kids go out and they take a poll um, and then they organize their data and they make it into a presentation. Um, and they do talk about the PowerPoint slide, how much should be on a slide, what information should be on a slide, so they do see that. Um, and that's all in grade six. Um, and then they also work on a um, geometry unit where they're creating um, the art piece, where they're creating a figure out of geometric shapes based on certain requirements that they're given on area um, or perimeter. Um, and then they also play a battle shapes game where it's kind of like battleships, that the kids have to make shapes um, and they make them on the computer on um, a geometer sketch pad program. And then they play like, you know, you sunk my battleship. They have to hit all the vertices to the shape. Um, so with, that's actually like the kids, the sixth graders really do that. Um, in seventh grade, you'll see we have a little video at the end. Um, they work on a house design project where they're given a certain amount of money. 
can they have to create the house of their dreams with that? Um, and it's gone from paper to now we use a CAD software, um, SketchUp that the kids are using. Um, and then they also do an advertising project. Um, Matt Ciccone likes to call it, um, he doesn't call it Shark Tank. Um, I think he calls it like Guppy Tank or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> where, where the kids um, create, come up with some kind of an idea um, for something new, um, and then they have to do an advertising proposal for it. Um, and then in grade eight, they do zone towers. Um, they use CAD software to design it, and then they actually create them using um, the zone pieces. Sketchpad animations, um, so they're actually able to make animations in Sketchpad. And then my favorite is the thermo cup, where the kids have to try to keep um, boiling water as hot as possible um, for the longest time in, their, in the classroom. So they use the Vernier software as well. Um, at the middle school, uh, middle school art, um, all art teachers, um, we have a goal to complete one STEAM-based project per marking period. Again, understanding it's always STEAM, but really drawing out those connections um, to go so far as to maybe reach out to one of the subject level teachers. Um, there's one project that's done is with Kandinsky, the artist, and it's very it's a lot of geometric shapes. So actually, the one art teacher that's at TJ and Memorial. He had said um, he would actually heard the students in dynamic applications talking about the animation. So he wants to talk to the dynamic applications teacher to see if they can animate the kids' Kandinsky work. So, you know, Mr. Rosenberg had said before about those, you know, the interdisciplinary connections. They're really all over. Like, we actually joke it should be Hustine, but the H is silent. The humanities are really in there as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, um, last year, um, the art teachers at the middle school had worked with like natural, uh, naturalistic mediums. So they went outside and sound, you know collect not just leaves but grass and different things. So they worked with the science teachers to see the science behind it. So those types of projects. So. Um, Two of these pictures are from the, the ones on the left and on the right are our students working on the zones, um, building towers, and then seeing how, how their buildings can hold up um, textbooks. And then on the left, they're using the, the CAD software. The, the middle one is a, a middle school uh, students doing an earth science project, which is ironic because they don't the textbooks we don't use anymore. <laughs> so it's kind of a combination. <laughs> Um, at the high school, uh, there's, there's many elective classes that, that relate to STEAM. Some of them are in the business department, the math department, uh, the technology and education department. Many of the, many of the skills that students learn in dynamic applications, they can apply in our architecture and design course uh, in the technology department, uh, in the, the introduction to engineering and design. They use a lot of the same programs. Uh, they use Google SketchUp, they use AutoCAD. Um, so, so we're finding that the students are more and more prepared for those upper level engineering classes having been through the middle school dynamic applications course. Um, I should add the, uh, the, the new STEM lab that we, we updated two years ago. Uh, I think we have five 3D printers now at the high school. We're looking to get a CDC machine. Um, Hear that? Think that exactly what that does. Um, but it, it has something to do with cutting different materials so that students can build things differently, not just with 3D printing. The competitions and events are something we're very proud of as well. I mentioned these are scholastic STEM competitions that students, students compete in, just interdisciplinary design competitions. We've hosted one of them at the high school about two years ago. The students compete with about two or three per year. Um, the Computer Science League that we compete in is actually international. Apparently the Croatian team is the team to beat. Um, uh, we also have our TSA competition. Um, last year we had um, students uh, come in the top 50 in the Moody's Mega Math Challenge. Um, kids on their own volition on a Saturday were given a task. They had 12 hours to compete it, uh, to complete it. Um, and out of 6,000 submissions, they placed in the top 50. Um, so that it had something to do with um, the, the parks, the national parks and, and all that stuff. So they use a variety of things to complete the task. Um, and then we also have a STEM career night. Um, teachers um, ask 
get um, people in all different careers to come in and talk to the kids um, about a variety of STEM careers, um, and then also our district arts festival as well. Yeah, those, those two things are something we're really proud of. The, the STEM career night is all developed by high school teachers. It's, it's organized by two math teachers, two science teachers, an engineering teacher. Um, we're talking about trying to get our teachers involved now as well. But what we find is a lot of times when people find that they're interested in science, they think, I have to be a doctor. They don't realize all these other careers that are available. So the, the teachers will put a doctor with an engineer. And the, so the students who go to hear the doctor will also hear the engineer speak. So they, they get exposed to many different things. Uh, the pasta bridge competition is something that geometry teachers have been doing for many years. Our tech ed teacher, who's an architect, got involved in that this year as part of his PLC. So those two teachers are working together to try to, to, to just re-envision re that whole program as well. So. Right, and the arts festival that always is not just, you know, you think arts, it's not just visual art. Um, we also have um, culinary and the engineering teacher woodshop, everyone. Um, so if you great. haven't gone to the District Arts Festival, this year that yeah, is something to do. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I thought you said that is something something to go to. It's yeah. something a sight to see. Yeah, really great. Um, applied art. Um, now, again, I think of all the high school courses um, or STEAM, you know, a little different than elementary and middle, which really are survey courses. Students are working with different mediums um, and different principles of art. But at the high school, um, you know, our art courses, ceramics, pottery, studio skills. Um, one that I really think of, though, when we talk about STEAM is applied art, which is taught by Jody Zielinski, who I have to say is just an amazing person and teacher. Um, and really, every single project, um, she brings in those other components. So she'll talk about the science behind silk screening. Um, which, you know, those are some of the pictures. We didn't have the actual shirts, but okay, so why do you have to use this color? What happens when the light reflects on it? If you look at it this way, um, the math skills for the block printing. Um, she actually even works with, um, on almost every project, another teacher in a different discipline. Um, when she worked with the Bridges and Stepping Stone students, they would do um, gingerbread houses. But they would bring in the math teacher and the culinary teacher, but talk about, OK, why are you going to do this? What happens if you just put this? Um, so it really is a collaboration of you know, all of the science, technology, engineering, math, and humanities, and every other subject as well. Yeah. Oh, those are some photos of uh, what the, uh, the gizmos looks like, as well as some students working in the technology and engineering uh, lab, the STEM lab. Um, and we have a short, we promise it's short, a short <laughs> video um, that uh, Lisa Lechek um, from Memorial, she teaches dynamic applications. Um, she put a video together just kind of highlighting.
any questions? Natalie? I just have a comment that I, I think what I like best about watching the video and all of the pictures is watching how the students are working together. It really shows you those 21st century skills where you have to learn how to collaborate and solve problems and think critically. And it's so nice to see them working in pairs and in teams. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. Ron had a question. Uh, I don't mind answering it. Thank you. John? No, I don't have a question, but I think it would be great if we could have like a STEM festival where people could come in and see all the things that these that they've been creating. You know, along with the art, I mean, there's the art festival. I think this would be so parents exactly know what STEM is. You know, I think that would be a great thing that maybe we could look into. Wonder if you can hook that up with the STEM night. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, just have some stuff yes. out yes. so people can come in and walk around and see it. Um. Anyone else? I, I have a question. So, within STEM and STEAM, so at the high school we have STEAM rooms, or? There's <laughs> 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 no STEAM at the high school. It's the boiler. <laughs> um, we have rooms. STEM labs. STEM yes. labs. It, there's, there's a, it's an engineering and design laboratory that kind of called the STEM lab. Okay. Um, architectural tables right. and the computers in, in a, a big semicircle kind of like this table. Set. That's the one you showed me last. Yeah, a couple years ago when 3D you printers. Um, the middle schools, to incorporate more STEAM and STEM, do we need STEAM labs there or or is it? I think, I think one thing to add on to that though, that, that room is not the only place that this stuff takes mm -hmm. place in. Like those robotics, where, where the robotics class is in the math classroom? Right, the, yeah, the robotics class at the high school is in the math computer lab. Um, so it's not down in the STEM lab, but, you know, and I think that so many times, like, same thing, like the art, art room, room is doing, might be doing science and math in there, so it's not necessarily a, a specific location. Sort of that flexibility of space, I think. Right. You, you know, you typically are working at tables because you're working in groups and you're working on projects, so you need that space available to do that. So if you had tables and you had computers and you had the manipulatives and those types of, of supplies and materials, it, it could work. Um, so I'm not sure. My, my question is kind of like when, when, it, when it came up when, when, we, when we were talking about the new, the new additions on the middle schools. To me, I didn't think that we needed a bigger room necessarily for middle school like if we wanted to just change the furniture in the room, mm -hmm. that, that that would work to, to do it as opposed to having a whole bigger space and, and a lot of um, extra wiring and, and that kind of thing. So you want to make sure that you have accessibility to um, internet and right. technology for sure. So you would want access to technology and you would want certain furniture to be able to make it work. Um, again, it doesn't mean it can't happen other places, and you can do, of course, state-of-the-art STEM labs. If, you know, that's that's where you were going. But we certainly managed to do lots of great STEAM and STEM projects um, by making the spaces. Where possible. we where, where I was going was was that should we be working it into our, our if it our if plan? It, it doesn't you can go first. it doesn't need to be in the plan or can it just be utilizing a space that's available. Can I, can I add a little bit? And it's, you know, I know we had conversations about do we need a lab? Mm -hmm. We need different, we need to do things differently in existing rooms. Mm -hmm. So if we want to visit these fancy labs that some schools have, the real focus is what Natalie said. You need to have access to the media, to the internet, but the types of tables and the furniture change dramatically. Think, think of a media center compared to an, uh, an older library. Mm -hmm. You need pods that connect in different ways. You notice that in many of the slides, I mean, this is very impressive. We had some students working at desks. That's okay. But the opportunity that we have <coughs> when we complete the addition is then selecting how we want to furnish the rooms. Mm -hmm. That should be different. I don't know if making the room a, a little bit longer or wider is going to make as much of an impact on instruction as how we furnish it, how we access it, mm -hmm. 
and do we have all of the equipment that we need? That, that to me, is the key. And, all, and you know, for those who may not know That's the board members, we were at convention last week, and when, when we walked around the STEM and STEAM section, it, the focus was not on rooms. The focus was on what you do within the room. That we can design for, for not a significant amount of additional cost, because the real cost is the, is the construction. It's what you do in it. Uh, who, who? You go first. Oh. Uh, I, was, uh, yeah, good, good, good. I was just going to say that um, if you're getting the, the cows, the carts, mm -hmm. then you can make any room. Sure. Yeah. A stem or steam. And we have dedicated cows for our dynamic applications classroom specifically because it is such an integral part of what they do right. every day in the classroom. But it makes and it mobile. They do ha exactly. Right. So they do have those cards yeah. available. And them. those classrooms also have big tables for the kids right. to work at. They're not working at that similar yeah. desk. They're, they're getting, getting right. smaller too, which is nice to find. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ron? Yeah. What you were yeah. saying before, exactly. Ron? Um, about the cutting thing last week at the school boards, I and that's that steam uh, section was really cool. They had these different machines. Uh, I have information on like where you can do wood cutting and then their own t shirts and where the kids can actually like as fundraisers. But there's a lot of little different things that they can do besides the 3D printing because I had actually never seen the 3D printer actually do it. And the guy showed me how it actually works and watching it was really cool. But I, I got some of that information and I, I meant to forward it to. Uh, Dr. Palestis and then the supervisors just to see if some of you guys can throw around. It's, it's interesting. I don't know what it costs or anything else like that. <laughs> but you know what? If it's something we're interested, we look into it. Something that we can, you know, look down the road together. Because I think it is so, like they actually had a thing that they, the kids make their own trophies in, in, in his school. And he says, we, we make all our own trophies now. We don't order one trophy. <laughs> yeah, he says, we don't order one trophy out, the mold and everything. <laughs> I wanted to add, uh, try to make a connection here. So we began the evening with Gary giving a wonderful presentation about digital literacy. And it's clear to me as we look at STEAM, there's, there's a very clear connection that can be made. So this, as the students are moving through this process, there's a need to do research. And those are the kind of connections that I see happening all over the Fairlawn District. And it's nice also to see how much of what we've been talking about at board meetings is connected. And that includes what we had here tonight as well as some of the other goals. But you know, this digital literacy and STEAM are perfect. Digital literacy is actually one of the science department goals as well. We're going to be working with Gary on Gisela and uh, the Gizmos is all connected as well. Well, several years ago, I remember that science and the English department worked together where science teachers went into the English classes and taught about science while well, the English teachers were talking to the science classes about how to write nonfiction pieces and I, it was a really nice collaboration then so um, you have been doing that for quite some time. Other comments from the board? Comments from the audience? That was my question. When is that on career night? It's not planned yet. It's, it's usually, usually March. March. Yep. It's all the teachers volunteer with that. So then that helps them decide what to take the next the next year. Because when do they do their schedules for the next year? It, oh. it, it, it helps them more so decide what they're interested in mm -hmm. being. But uh, we welcome freshmen to come, sophomores. We have some eighth graders that come in the past. I think we, in the past few years, we had two, two, 200 kids. Yeah, so really well, well attended. Yep. And then at the end of the night, there's time, like the, the speakers will come to the cafeteria and they'll kind of mingle with yeah. It's a nice evening. So, I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, um, this always amazes me, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm dead serious about this. Whenever we have presentations from our subject supervisors, all the subject supervisors show up. They all stay, um, even after the presentation. They're here even if they don't have a presentation to support each other. And I, I truly believe that that is one of the biggest assets we have in the school district. 
and it's time, you've, you guys have proven it to me time and time again, um, and I appreciate you all supporting each other because it shows me as a board member um, that you do this all the time, that it, it isn't just for the board, for the board. This is how you work, and this is how we work in Fairlawn. So I'm, I'm really impressed. I was really impressed with all the presentations tonight. Um, the STEAM presentation really, or can we call it STEAM now? <laughs> um, really opened my eyes to, you know, I knew what every part of this existed, but seeing it all together um, and seeing that we're always working to add on to, um, add on to it is really impressive and I want to thank all of you Natalie thank you and, and Nick thank you too um, and of course Dr. Blesses um, but thank you and Mr. Temme thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mission accomplished.